Alcohol is the number one drug of choice for today's teenagers. Despite the legal drinking age of 21, a 16-year-old in the United States is more likely to die of an alcohol-related cause than any other. Last year's prom, I drank a whole bottle of rum by myself. I've had plenty of competition with drinking and I've won every single one of them. It's the end of the school year. Chris and his buddy Brad are getting ready for their high school prom, an annual event notorious for drinking and getting drunk. Oh, what all the kids are about to do. Drink as much as they can, get messed up as they can before they walk in there. My name is Mary Allen and I'm 17 years old. Part of the alcohol we're getting comes from my friend's parents. She just goes into her liquor cabinet, takes it out. <laughs> All right. You're looking uh, yeah, yeah, spit. Yeah. My name is Manny, and I'm 17. My girlfriend's going to be there, so I'm going to try to not get as drunk as I normally would if I was only with my friends, because she doesn't drink. Thank you. Bye, Manny. It's definitely better that parents don't know everything that goes on they have an idea, but they're not even close. I'm not like addicted to alcohol. It's not something I have to have. Something pretty bad would really have to happen to me or to someone I cared about for me to really change how I feel about underage drinking and drinking in general. Blow into this tube until I tell you to stop. Two weeks after the prom and sober, the teens get a chance to experience how alcohol affects their vision and coordination without actually taking a drink. Put it directly in front of the other and your hands are at your side. Okay, hold on. First, they try walking while wearing drunk vision goggles. You think you're on the line? Do you think you're on the line? I can't even see you. Next, they get behind the wheel of a specially altered car. Everything okay, Chris? Taking so much road if everything's okay. The braking and steering on this Dodge Neon have been programmed to simulate the delayed reactions of an intoxicated driver. Now think of those cones in real life as being trees, mailboxes, parked cars. You know, real things that you'd be getting, not just cones, right? Watching for pedestrians. Stop. Dude, he's a little kid. Why did you uh, hesitate to stop like that? Was, that was for delayed reaction and right uh -huh. now in real life it'd be your reaction time always change that much not the car because you wouldn't feel any change or differences in fact you think you're actually doing better that's how much your reaction time would have slowed down just go right on in i'm really scared to see this <laughs> to learn more about the other side of getting drunk manny and mary ellen were invited to spend the afternoon with the dade county medical examiner the teens had no idea what to expect. This is a couple, a boyfriend and girlfriend. Two real it's livers. Safe, real liver. They're in an automobile accident. He's in his mid-30s. They both are. How long ago did they? These were yesterday. Wow. And if you feel the difference, I want you to feel the difference. Because this is nice brown color. Yeah. This is fatty really from all the fatty buildup. This is her liver. Take your fingers and pinch it. See, it's soft. Yeah. It's a normal, healthy liver. Go ahead, <laughs> stick your finger in it. Wow. Now do this to this one. Go ahead, force your finger through. Ooh, this one's hard. hard. It's hard. How come? It's from the drinking. You get a scar in the uh, liver, and that's part of the process of cirrhosis in an end-stage liver, which this is, man is heading for pretty soon. Eventually, it's going to shrivel up even more, and it's going to stop functioning. You can't live without your liver. Other organs involved are your testicles, for example. The guys love this. They actually shrivel down nice and small. So is this person not had any alcohol in She, like, never drank? No, she doesn't drink. She uh -oh. was just dumb enough to get in the car with this guy who was driving. They're both dead. Leaving the livers behind, Manny and Mary Ellen find out what would happen to them if they were admitted to the emergency room for alcohol poisoning. You make it nice and tight. And then depending upon your degree of cooperation, if you're able to sit up and drink, we give you this in a cup. I don't really and have I need a scissor to cut it. This is called oh. charcoal, all right? And it will help absorb the poisons so in the, like in the you, alcohol. It's like a bagel maybe, would that do the same thing? A bagel? No. You, you always hear breads and stuff. Yeah. Huh? Bread, yeah. Yeah. Um, a bagel does not do the same thing. Would you like to try a taste? Yeah, it tastes like, like Huh? Drink it. Taste it. 
Okay, okay well, let me explain to you what we do. It looks, does she look good? Does she look nice? Does she look, there's a sink over there. That's good. Would you like to taste some? You sure? Look at your teeth and your tongue. It stays like that for hours. Here, just put the cup down. Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. I'm being totally serious. If a patient is totally passed out and having trouble breathing, we have to intubate them. Cool, Look right. at this tube. And that's not going to fit you, in my nose. You get it to go like with an enormous amount of force, and it's very unpleasant. We're a normal mom and dad, just like your mom and dad's. This is our son, Larry. His birthday would have been tomorrow. Yeah. He'd been 28 years old. That's his prom. That was when he graduated. You know, eventually in your life, you plan to lose your mother. You plan to lose your father. You know, maybe your spouse as you get older. But you never plan to lose very one of your children. And it's something that's really hard to deal with. Larry Wooten was a junior at the University of Florida. On a Monday night in 1991, he went to a bar with his friend Steve, who held the record for 22 shots of alcohol consumed in an hour. Larry decided to beat that record. On the 12th shot, he almost threw up. He was about to get sick. And, you know, we thought that was fine, of course. He uh, kept going. He did the 23 shots, fell on the way out the door. Had to, had to pick him up, we walked. I carried him there, like, kind of like carrying him, he was stumbling. We put him in the back and we drove the car. My roommates and I decided we would put him in my bathroom. We laid him down on the side just in case because he'd been throwing up. When we went to bed, it was about three hours later. We thought we heard him snoring, but that wasn't snoring. His hands were blue. His feet were blue. And we called the paramedics. And I was praying, man. Praying that he would come out of it. But when we got to Gainesville, well, that's when they out the kit. You know, because they're all crying and and uh, they asked us to go in and see him and he didn't want me to go in there and I said no I have to do this I, and I did I went in there that's when it hit because he was gone and it was Aunt Judy and she was like how could someone have let him do this and she said Steve you weren't there were you and I had the wall was sticking in my head and I was like I was sitting right next to him paying for the stuff but you know when you're all partying, you don't know you're going to keep going and going. You forget. It's, it's, Look, really, they, it's death certificate. It's all we have out of 21 years. One stupid night, man. One That's right. pointless night. They were best friends. It's like me and Chris, blonde hair, blue eyes, you know. And it's just, I mean, it can happen. You know what I mean? You touched me. I'm glad. That's why we're here. I know. Can I hug him? <laughs> you even made me cry. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Sorry. That's okay. The awful news came late one night, long before the morning light. The tears, the hurt, could not compare to the way that I felt when I saw you there. I still don't know why this happened to you. My wonderful son with those eyes so blue. The hurt, the pain so deep in my chest only got worse when I laid you to rest son you are safe now and in God's hands and someday we'll see you in some other land alcohol kills more than five times the number of people killed by cocaine heroin and every other illegal drug combined I 
I've chosen not to drink, first of all, because of the taste. The taste is kind of foul. I'm naturally high, I can naturally have fun with my friends, and I don't need anything to put inside of me to just have a ball and go crazy. Another one of my turnoffs is guys getting all aggressive and nasty. They feel like they need this alcohol to get all loose, and then they're like, oh, tired. <laughs> alcohol alters who you are. So just stay away from it. Love yourself. Be yourself, because that's what's really cool. My name is Tara. I'm 17. I had my first drink when I was 13 years old. My sister probably drinks, uh, you know, I don't think she drinks as much as I used to. I would say I drink about four to five times a week. I haven't had the bad experiences to where I'm saying I gotta stop. I gotta pull back because everything seems good right now. It's fun. I'm sure my mind is uh, wasting away brain cells when I drink, but at what rate, I don't know. Convinced that alcohol problems are far in their future, Tara, Nathan, and their older brother Brian joined us to find out how alcohol might already be affecting their lives, more specifically, their brains. What we do here is we get three-dimensional pictures of the brain, any guesses on which one's normal and which one's not. That's normal. Yeah, and how we can tell it's normal is there's just nice, full, smooth, even activity. This is a person that's drank a lot of alcohol through the years. She's wow. uh, not quite 40, but what you see is overall decreased activity, or we call it scalloping, or it actually sort of looks shriveled. With alcoholism comes a decreased ability to learn. You know, the more we learn, the more actually our brain grows, the more our brain makes connections. And when you drink, you decrease those connections and you decrease your ability to learn. We scan kids as young as 14 who've been drinking since they were 11, and you can already begin to see oh, wow. the scalloping or the shriveled effect. I'm going to use this tape here to hold you in place. Eager to see if alcohol really changes his brain, Nathan volunteers to get his brain scanned. First, okay, while well, sober. Here we go. And then, after getting drunk. The drinking begins. A California Highway Patrol officer confirms Nathan is indeed officially intoxicated. 0.109, so he is just over the legal legal limit of 0 0.08. Alcohol is a very significant suppressor of brain activity. It shuts down brain activity, and so you won't think as clearly, you won't make as good a decisions, you'll be more impulsive, you'll act like you're only working without the brain. I know that I can drive home safely right now, assuming that no other drivers cut in front of me and, and you know, smash into me. Nathan undergoes his second scan. It's now time to see if there's a difference between his sober and his intoxicated brain. Nathan's sober brain is on the left, his brain on alcohol on the right. Yeah. Looks like Swiss cheese. If you look back here, here's your coordination part of your brain. You see how much smaller it is. And so even though your perception is, you can drive, no problem, you'll be the same. That part of your brain that controls that is not the same. The thing I'm very concerned about with your brain is your ability to drink more and more and still be able to function. And we can see it hurting your brain and you're still standing, which means your cells are craving alcohol. You just have to ask yourself, you know, which, which brain do you want? I'll take Engine. the better of the two. <laughs> I want to know what mine looks like now. It's Tara's turn next. Even though she is sober, will Tara's brain already show signs of alcohol damage? This is your brain. And we're looking underneath. What do you mean? You can see there's a lot of holes. It's already beginning to get some bumps. Really? Wow. And we're beginning to see already there's some decreased activity wow. in your brain. And that's not what you want. You see this little valley going between the two sides? Yeah. That shouldn't be there. Really? We're too young to have that. I mean, we get that as we age. If you continue to drink, it's going to get worse. Given that, you also have a lot of really good brain activity. And odds are, because you're young, it'll come back and you'll be able to have a happier life. If you keep drinking when you're 30, you'll have the brain of a 70-year-old. No. Yeah. I'm dead serious. 
<laughs> See, when you say that, that there's that there's no way I can continue with that. I will not have a problem quitting, you know, just to see what, what happens. From what I saw today, looking at my own brain, what I heard, what the effects can be, I'm going to quit. I mean, I'm going to try my hardest to just stop completely. I mean, that's how we function. That's my brain. That's what's going to keep me going and get me a career and a family and make good decisions. And it's not worth two hours of just goofing off and being someone else for that, that damage in the long run. Drinking just to get drunk, it's one word stupid, ugly. Don't do it! Or I'm Hercules, damn it, I'll come to your house. It's a total waste of time. You know, why can't you just be yourself? Be smart, you get one life. Why do you want to waste it being wasted? The truth is, everyone who drinks runs the risk of abusing alcohol. There are at least 14 million alcoholics in America, and approximately 2 million of them are teenagers. This is One Girl's Story. Just to go over that one more time, you tell me that you took your mom's car without permission, you weren't a licensed driver, and you were driving drunk. Yeah. And I hit a dog that was in the road. Did you mean to do that? No. My name's Jolene and I'm 16. I feel like I have a problem with drugs and alcohol and I can't handle myself. When I do them, if they're there, I do all that I can do. Are charges being pressed? Or? No, my mom's holding back charges if I'm willing to get sober. Jolene has made the decision to get help. For the next six months, she will eat, sleep, work, study, and heal at a substance abuse treatment facility called Touchstones. I know inside of you there's a lot of pain. That takes a lot of courage to face your problems without drinking. I feel like I don't deserve anything anymore and I've had my chance, you know. I mean, I have been given so many chances. I thought I was having a lot of fun. I thought everything was just great and I had all these good friends, you know, who would take care of me if anything bad happened to me. Last weekend I realized, you know, <laughs> people won't take care of me. was Saturday night, the next thing I know it's Monday night, and I'm just thinking like, what the heck happened? I mean, I can remember little stuff, you know? I remember walking around barefoot, and I remember having blood all over me. And I was covered in dirt, and it's not fun to be out on the streets. It was a big wake-up call for me. Every week, Jolene and her family attend group counseling. Every time that you use the word stupid when it comes to your previous, you know, your relapses or not being able to clean, just tell yourself you have a disease. That's what you're learning here. Do what you tell someone diabetes that they're stupid? No. No. If it was as simple as to be smart and stay clean, there would be a lot more clean people. It's not about that. I've never met I hope that I find a reason to stay sober, you know? I hope that I start seeing, like, the joy in life. Oh, my God that my friends, you know, have, that I hear people sober inside Alcoholics Anonymous have. Okay, here's my month chip from AA. 30 days of sobriety. Here's my month keychain from NA, but I've been chewing on it. In the next 30 seconds, someone in America will be injured or killed in a drunk driving accident. You probably think it could never happen to you. Think again. Even one or two drinks can be deadly behind the wheel. Why take the chance? 30 seconds up. Hope it wasn't you. My name is Caroline and I'm 17 years old. Drinking is a big part of my life. So now I can drink and be cool. My name is Peter, I'm 15, and I had my first drink when I was 13. If you really honestly think that it's all right for you to drink and drive, then by all means, it's all right for you to drink and drive because all you can do is take care of your own self. If the driver's a little buzzed and I figure, okay, he'll get me home on time and I'll be okay, 
so that's really what I think about is getting home really more than who's driving. I mean, I know it could happen to me, but I just don't really care about that. It would take somebody really close to me getting injured. I think that would be a reality check for me. San Diego, California, August 2nd, 1996. Three young men choose to get into a car after drinking. Tragically, the driver is the only one who survives. The parents of the passengers are left to grieve. I'm Craig's mom. Craig was 19 when he was killed. And you fellas remind me of my son. He wore the pants just like that. Still in prison, the driver of the car agrees to meet with our teens. So, okay. I'm Graham, story. I guess you tell you why I'm here. I'm here for two counts of vehicle manslaughter, which right on the influence. Now, Craig was involved in an automobile crash. He and Graham and another boy named Adam were um, drinking beer. They decided that they were going to get some cigarettes at the 7-Eleven. I hit a tree in my friend's car and both my friend's own died. My son was uh, killed on impact. Graham was sentenced to two years for the deaths of his best friends, Craig Markley and Adam Lazinski, both 19 years old. I was just pretty much every normal kid growing up and going out on the weekends and because of an irrational and um, unresponsible decision, I've changed the lives of other people. You guys think you think of like, the after effects of what happens when you leave parties or whatever? Not when you... I mean, you just think, no. you just think like getting home and your parents not really, yeah. you know. Yeah, you don't think about like actually like killing them. Yeah, I mean, I never thought of that either. And then one minute later, and here I am and they're gone and being locked up, whatever. I mean, it's not that fun, but it's not the worst part of losing my friends. You know? It's my fault. If I could take it all back, I would do different, you know. I, I wish I could, but I can't. It just really gets home. I mean, he looks like us, everyone else, and it's just really sad that someone so close to them is taken away so abruptly without, I don't know. With the help of the San Diego Police Department, we came up with a shocking way for our teenagers to experience firsthand what drinking and driving is really about. They have no idea what's going to happen to them. This particular one here came in early this morning. This morning? Yeah. Four local teenagers were coming home from an all-night graduation party. Um, there was alcohol involved. The uh, driver was going a little too fast, lost control, uh, went off the road and smacked into a tree. Uh, we're not sure the outcome of the uh, kids right now, but we understand it as well as you can tell, the crash is really bad. One of them was a 17-year-old girl by the name of Angela Mongrello, a 15-year-old boy by the name of Peter Vitale, Vitale, a 15-year-old boy by the name of Chase Edwards, and a 17-year-old girl by the name of Caroline Flattery. After learning that they were the victims of the fatal drunk driving crash, the teens traveled to the police department to learn more. To make this experience as real as possible, the teenager's own parents agreed to help us. What I'm going to show you here is a videotape that shows uh, what goes on after an accident, some of the things that uh, people don't realize. That's my house. Hello, it's Edward. Well, I have some bad news for you. Early this morning, there was a car accident involving four teenagers. Unfortunately, your son Chase was one of the passengers in the car. We uh, yes. suspect that alcohol was involved. <sighs> Ms. Edwards, I'm sorry, but your son was killed in this accident. Somebody from the coroner's office will be contacting you. We both will have to go down and identify the body. Your daughter Caroline was a passenger in the car. Your daughter passed away. Oh no. On the way to the hospital. I'm sorry. Your son was the driver of the car. 
He's okay. Unfortunately, uh, two of the passengers have already died, and one of them is pending death at the hospital as we speak. So there's, there's nothing really you can do for him right now until we contact you and have you come down to the station to pick him up. Just uh, stay by the phone and wait for our call, and uh, he'll come down and uh, see your son. Peter, stand up and grind your back. You have the right to remain silent. You are the driver. You have the right to the presence of an attorney. Let alcohol level was a point one three. Anything you say may be used against you in a court of law. Do you understand? Yeah. Well, what's going to happen now, uh, Peter, is you're going to be charged with two counts of vehicular manslaughter, which are felonies. One count of felony drunk driving. Pretty much your life as you know it right now is over. You're looking to go into state prison. We take the handcuffs off Peter, and the foursome continues to their next stop. Medical examiner's office. Ah! Can somebody bring out the uh, bodies, please? We've got some fatalities to show you. Three kids who died in a traffic accident because of drunk driving. Quite frankly, these are three kids who graduated last night. And now you're going to see what they actually graduated to because of their drinking and driving. You know, this was Chase Edwards. We're pretty sure it's Chase because he was supposed to be in the car. But we can't do a visual or facial identification because of the damages of what happened to him. Since he was in the right front seat, the entire roof, front pillars, windshield, slide window, and tree all came in and basically took out his head, his neck, and the upper right side of his body. Chase is going to be a closed casket for his family. Carolyn uh, came in very shortly after Chase did. She was wearing her belt, but, but she didn't have her belt tightened up. And as uh, she impacted, uh, her entire abdomen, pelvis, and so forth came into that seat belt and basically shattered her liver and spleen. We just received uh, Angela from UC uh, Medical Center. She was behind the driver but she was unrestrained. The car stopped, she did, and she kind of came up out of her seat and impacted her head and neck on the uh, roof of the car and kind of drove them down onto the top of her spine. So there we are. They thought it was just, uh, as we say, maybe the end of the beginning of their lives and they were going to go on to bigger and greater things, but unfortunately this is just the end. The teens are then asked to write a final goodbye to their families. There is one more stop on our journey. Those are my parents. Oh, oh They're my parents. Oh, are you kidding me? Those four chairs are yours, you guys, okay? All so right. we say if you can just come on and walk over to those. We are gathered here to pay our last respects to three young adults whose life were tragically taken from us. Angela, Chase, and Caroline. And I know at this time, some of your parents have something you'd like to read. Here's Caroline. We miss you so very much. Why did you have to go? I know. I know it will be a better world where you are now. I'm so deeply sorry that my life has ended so abruptly and the tragic loss that it has caused you. I'm the one who made the decision to get in the car with Peter, and I'm the one who's suffering the most. Please remember all the memories that we have throughout our lives. For you have shown me <laughs> and taught me all that is beautiful, good, and wondrous about life. Take care of yourself when you're gone. Make sure to remember your daughter for always. I will happily remember you. Remember the memories and keep me alive. Love, Caroline. Dear Angela, when you were a little baby, I would go to your crib and stand quietly watching your little chest rise and fall to make sure that you were still breathing. Even through the night, I would wake up and constantly watch. I guess this is a thank you for everything that you've given me, not only material things, but the value and love that you've instilled in me that enabled me to be my own person. And most of all, to be stubborn as hell and to always stand up for what I believe in. When we would say, be careful as you went out the door, under our breath we were saying, Heavenly Father, protect our child on her way. And I love you with all my heart, more than you would ever know. 
I'm so sorry for anything that I've ever done to hurt you. I love you, Mom and Dad. Love all of you forever, you know. Dear Chase, we'll never know what you could have become, for you have no future here on Earth. But I do know very well who you are. You are my son. You are my joy. You are my beautiful, beautiful boy. And my last words to my family, I'd like to start off by saying uh, <laughs> that I'm sorry for all the trouble I've caused you over the last <laughs> years. What I've done and what I do, I do not do to hurt you guys in any way. I do it because I'm a teenager. I love you so very much. Mom and I will miss you deeply and think of you every day for the rest of our lives. To my brothers, don't make the mistake that I did by getting in the car with a drunk person. I'm sorry that my life has ended in a careless mistake that I've made. Overcome with emotion, neither Peter nor his mother are able to read their last words to each other. The experience over, everyone is given a second chance. It's good that it's only make believe. <laughs> I didn't feel that way today, though. I have a body bag, can I? <laughs> well, I'll see myself dead. Call it dead pack on me. Uh, I totally called my parents before I even thought about like getting in the car, especially down the wheel. You can't deny things anymore. You could deny it and make believe it doesn't happen, but when you've been through it like this, there's no point in denying it. So you might as well hit head on that this is what they should be afraid of, not us. We love them more than life itself. You're not supposed to drink and drive, and you're not supposed to do this, and you're not supposed to do that. And it's just like, you did it, you know, it's there. Alcohol-related car crashes are the number one killer of teenagers. The truth about drinking is that it's illegal if you're under the age of 21. But 75% of teenagers admit they can buy their own alcohol. Of the teens you've met this hour, all have decided to rethink their drinking. Some have decided to drink less. And others have made the pledge to quit drinking alcohol completely. So the next time you want to get wasted, plastered, thrashed, or faded, remember the truth about drinking. In the next 24 hours, 10,000 teenagers will gamble with their lives and try alcohol for the first time. Some will become dependent on it, some will die from it, and some will cause others to die. As a teenager, the worst thing you can do is ignore the truth. As a parent, the worst thing you can do is to do nothing. If you need help or would like to learn more about alcohol or alcohol abuse, contact the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Hotline, 1-800-729-6686. Or visit our website at www.teenissues.com.